In the modern world, species from all kingdoms of life are on the move. Through human activity, many species are transported to new areas where they grow, reproduce, and thrive. And there are thousands of non-native species in the United States. A more limited subset of those is invasive species. And those are non-native species that cause or have the potential to cause economic harm or harm to human health. After settling into their new homes, these invasive species can cause billions of dollars of damage to ecosystems that provide us with resources, such as timber. One group of non-native species in North America that we are all familiar with is earthworms, creatures capable of doing great harm and great good. A group of creatures that, by chewing up carbon in the soil, could even impact the course of climate change. Today, if we look at the earthworms that are in this soil, virtually all of them will be non-native species. Pretty much 100% of the earthworms that are in your garden, that are in your lawn, that you find on the sidewalks after a rain are non-native species. Oh, here we go. This is one of our non-natives. This is Lumbricus rubellus. Some earthworms came as early as the 1600s with the first European settlers in ship ballast and potted plants. So there are a whole variety of mechanisms by which they came over. Most of them were probably not on purpose. Today, we know that earthworms are good for gardens. But are they good for forests? So for the same reasons that earthworms are really good for your garden, they can actually do a lot of damage to forests such as the one we're standing in here. The plants in North American forests are already adapted to the tough soil. When earthworms come in, the soil composition changes, and this changes what plants will flourish. Native plants may not do as well with the new soil. If nutrients here were suddenly much more available, say if we fertilized a bunch of this forest, we would get a very, very different group of plant species. And in that group of plant species would be a lot of non-native plants that are able to get at those nutrients. To find out if earthworms can be classified as harmful invasive species, Dennis Wiggums and Melissa McCormick's research team, in collaboration with Purdue University, compares the abundance of earthworms to forest damage. The team tests for abundance by adding electric current to the ground, causing the earthworms to move to the surface. So we have conducting rods into the soil and we apply that current and it creates an electric field that stimulates the worms to get out of the way so they come to the surface. Another sign of earthworm abundance is at the surface of the soil. Earthworm waste or casts, reveal that all of the soil at this site has been digested by earthworms. So here we're in a young forest. And if you pull back the leaf litter that's just fallen this year, what you see is bare soil. You can see all of these little holes here are earthworm burrows. And if you look closely at the surface of the soil, what you'll see is it's made up almost entirely of this here, which is earthworm casts. So this is all soil, but it's all soil that has passed through an earthworm gut once, if not several times. The team has found that earthworms are very abundant in young forests. So two months ago, this surface was covered by leaves, just like this. And two months later, you can see nothing is here. Everything is gone and the worms were super hungry. They eat all of them. By digesting so much of the soil and leaves, earthworms repackage many of the nutrients into different forms that make them less accessible for plants. Cool. In gobbling up all of the soil, they also are gobbling up many of the microorganisms that are in the soil. And it could be that some of the species in the forest that require fungi in association with their roots, which is most of the plants, that they could not do as well. And what we found is that uh, the red oak, for example, was a species that its growth was less in situations where there were a lot of earthworms. 
to make sure that earthworms are the cause of the decrease of accessible nutrients. The team studies plots in a mature forest where there are no earthworms. You might remember as we were in the young forest, the leaves were added two months ago and now they've all gone. But here, those leaves have been added at the same time uh, as the young forest. But you can see they are still here, nothing changed. And the main reason for this is there's no hungry worms eating those leaves. In the earthworm-free soil, the team finds plenty of fungi that provide nutrients that help native plants and trees to grow. So in terms of both the diversity of fungi that we find in the soil and in terms of the absolute abundance of fungi that we find in the soil, this soil here is much, much higher than the young forest soil. The lack of nutrients in a young forest could be interpreted as evidence for earthworms to be classified as invasive. But there are signs that earthworms may be an asset to us for one very important global issue, climate change. Soil is the largest repository of carbon on Earth. Earthworms may be helping to store more carbon, which keeps it from being released into the atmosphere. Working with Tim Philly of Purdue University, Yin Ni Ma analyzes the carbon in soil samples to test this hypothesis. So here are my samples that I took from the different field site, and some of them are from the young forest, and the others are from the mature forest. They really look similar now, but the internal process and microbes growing in them is different. Ma measures the amount of carbon dioxide within each test tube. If the carbon in the soil is unstable, there will be more carbon dioxide in the sample. During the incubation time, the microbes will grow in the soil and they evolve carbon dioxide. And those carbon dioxide will accumulate in those vials so we can measure if there is different amount of carbon dioxide has been evolved from different soil sites. Ma found that young forests that have many earthworms release more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than mature forests. This means that earthworms may actually be contributing to releasing more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The results I got from for now is there is much more CO2 evolved from the young forest compared to the mature forest. That means uh, the microbes are releasing more carbon dioxide from the young forest. But Ma's results are only in the short term. In the long term, the team suspects that earthworms are helping to prevent climate change. Earthworms also change the forms of carbon that are stored in the soil. And so for that reason, they can actually make it so that the carbon that does remain in the soil, that is not released right away, is stored for a much longer time. They can actually protect the carbon. In some cases, by moving it down to the deeper layers, they can also make it so that it's much harder for that carbon to get broken down. So over the long term, they may actually be increasing the amount of carbon that's stored in the soil even though in the short term, they're increasing the amount of carbon that's released. The results from the carbon experiment so far do not give a clear answer as to whether or not earthworms are helping with climate change. So what that balance is between the short-term increase and a possible long-term decrease, whether that's beneficial or detrimental, we don't yet know. The answer to the question are earthworms invasive species? Could be a key factor in keeping forests healthy and in storing carbon below the ground, helping us to combat climate change. I think we really need to know more about the consequences of having these things in our environment because we're living in a world now where they're present, they're going to be present, they're going to be expanding as people move things around the earth even more and we really need to understand that if we're going to manage ecosystems and understand what's going on around us.